Hi everyone and welcome to our video about photosynthesis investigations, the final video in our little photosynthesis series. What we're going to be looking at in today's video is the practical investigations into the factors that could affect the rate of photosynthesis. First thing we need to know then is how can we calculate the rate of photosynthesis in an experiment. Now back at GCSE you probably did a really simple experiment where you had something like a bit of pond weed in a beaker filled with some water, probably had a funnel chucked over the top of it at that point as well, and you were then counting some bubbles. Now, when we did that, that would give us a measure of how much gas is being produced in a certain time. It wasn't a very good measure, but it was a measure all the same. You may have upgraded that slightly by having a little upturned measuring cylinder chucked over the top to then collect said gas. What we were obtaining there was a volume of oxygen in a certain time. So we'd then have a volume, we'd have a time, and volume divided by time gives us the rate. Before we move on, it's worth us just mentioning one of the issues of the counting bubbles method. So if all we're doing is going to count the bubbles being produced, we've basically got two key problems. First one is it's really easy to miss some bubbles. So when we're actually counting, if they're going particularly quick, it's dead easy to miss one. And secondly, our volumes of bubbles are not the same. So each bubble does not contain the exact same volume of gas. So we've got two key problems there. If we just think generally about limitations with using the volume of oxygen produced, then it's never going to be a perfect measure of the rate of photosynthesis. And one reason for that is that some of the oxygen that we are producing in photosynthesis is going to be used in the process of respiration. So not all of the oxygen produced in photosynthesis will be released from the plant. Some of it will be used by those cells in respiration, so we will never be able to collect that oxygen. Secondly, we may find that when we're collecting the gas, it's not all oxygen we're collecting. We could have some dissolved nitrogen in that collected gas as well. So those two reasons are limitations for this collecting the volume of oxygen as a measure of the rate of photosynthesis. At A level, I'm hoping you have seen, even if you haven't used it, at least seen the little setup of this thing here, okay? Now, this bit of equipment, looks super fancy, is something called a photosynthometer. Now, that is basically a flashy scientific biology way of saying we've got a teeny tiny tube on a scale, because that's pretty much what this is. So if we have a look at the diagram, what we can see We've got our standard bit of pondweed, and we've then got a little tiny funnel collected over the top there, which is usually just the end of a capillary tube. I'm not gonna lie, it's not like a separate funnel. Now, a capillary tube, I'm hoping we know, is a very thin glass tube with an even smaller tube running down the middle of it. We then have a scale, which is pretty much a ruler, and then we've got a syringe on the other end of our tube. So, how does this work? We would set up our experiment. We would then allow it to obviously create some nice little oxygen. And then using the syringe, what we can actually do is move the bubble. So basically what we can do is collect a volume of gas over a known period of time. We would then be able to use that syringe to draw our gas bubble into the part of the capillary tube that lines up nicely with our scale here and then we can read off the length of our bubble. Why would we do that? Because if we know the actual bore of our capillary tube, then what we can do is calculate the volume of gas. All we need to do to do that, length of bubble times pi r squared. And obviously r is our radius in terms of our tube there. So very straightforward to do this, pi r squared, because obviously that hopefully we remember is all to do with circles, but because we've got a long bubble, times it by the length. 
Before we leave this whole idea of photosynthesis investigations, we are going to recap a few key principles about the experimental work. We're not going through the whole thing because on your exam paper, they're not going to ask you to design an entire plan for a photosynthesis investigation because that was one of your PAGs in theory, or at least you would have had a chance to look at a potential photosynthesis investigation. We're going to recap on a few of these bits that can come up as exam questions. First one, variables. Your independent variable is the one that you are changing. So in an investigation where we were looking to see how light intensity affects the rate of photosynthesis, our independent variable would be the light intensity. Dependent variable, what you're measuring. So this would usually be the volume of oxygen in a lot of our experiments here. And then the controlled variables are other variables that could change, but through how we design our experiment, we're going to make sure they stay the same. So this could be as simple as things like the type of pondweed that we're using. We also need to consider things like temperature, because if you imagine that we've got our little measuring cylinder or beaker with our pondweed in water here, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a lamp set up over here. Now, obviously, when the light is on, we've got light, but we also have heat. So if we were just to have it set up like this, we would not only be changing the light intensity, but we'd also potentially be changing the temperature of the water. Now, we don't want that to happen. So in that scenario, what we usually do is stick a huge measuring cylinder in there filled with water, because that is then going to prevent the water in our pondweed from heating up because it will be heating up the water in the measuring cylinder first. The other experiment that I'm going to briefly mention that again should be something you're familiar with from your work on your PAGs is the TLC of the photosynthetic pigments. So you may have done this one, you may not, because obviously it's one of three potential options for this PAG that OCR actually give you. But we'll have a quick recap on the basics. What we start off with, leaves of some description. And we're going to grind those leaves up with some propanone and a pestle and mortar. So basically in your pestle and mortar, you've just chucked some propanone, thrown some leaves in, ground them all up into a lovely pulpy mess. We're then going to draw a little pencil line about a centimetre up from the base of your TLC plate. And TLC, remember, stands for thin layer chromatography. And then we're going to use our pipette to put a little bit of our extract on that pencil line. Now, the idea is that you do it a single drop at a time, let it dry, add another little drop to it. This is usually using a capillary tube, if I'm being honest. And the idea being to have it as small as possible. Once it's all dry, you place it in your jar with the solvent and then you wait. You're going to wait as that solvent moves up your TLC plate and then you would remove it when it reaches near the top. Don't let it run off the top of the plate. What we then do is we're going to record some distances. So this here gives us a little bit of an example of the kind of thing you could get. So we've got different color bands which are representing the different pigments. So what we do is we'd measure from our pencil line here with a ruler very carefully to the center of each of those bands. Now that gives us the distance moved by our substance. We then divide that by the distance moved by the solvent. So we can see the solvent reached here again from pencil line to that top part. And then to calculate this thing called the RF value, distance moved by the substance, divided by the distance moved by the solvent. It will always be a value between zero and one. So if your answer is not between zero and one, either you've measured something wrong or you've put them the wrong way around on your calculator. Flip them, probably got it right. As always, I do recommend that you subscribe to the channel so you can see when we upload another video. And don't forget to head on over to the A-Level Biology website where you can find a range of other resources to help you in your A-Level Biology studies.